Welcome to Speak for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. Coming up, I'll tell you why I have no problem with the Steelers going after Le'Veon Bell. But we begin today with football, NFL football, the greatest game ever to be played. The NFL season kicks off in a few hours with the Eagles taking on the Falcons. For my money, this is the best day of the year. I get to plop down on my couch, pour some Casa Dragonis over ice, order teriyaki wings from Wingspot, barbecue chicken pizza from Fresh Brothers, a hickory brisket and bacon cheeseburger from BJ's, a spicy tuna bowl from Sweet Fin Poke, a salad from Chop Stop, and watch football. Tonight is as close as I can get to heaven without Tamron Hall's involvement. Unfortunately, there are forces at work trying to ruin my pigskin paradise. Pig out paradise. Pipe down, Brian, it's a pigskin paradise. Rather than fixate on football, the game's enemies want me to worry about CTE, criminal justice reform, domestic violence, and other serious matters. I'm sorry, but that's not what I want to do when I'm watching football. I want to see gladiators compete at the highest level. This desire does not make me inhumane, immature, or evil. It makes me human. I cannot weigh the world's problems 24 hours a day, and neither can you. You have jobs to work, bills to pay, spouses to please, children to parent, parents to worry about, you have responsibilities. Football is our escape. People who care little of football don't want you to escape. There are a handful of professional football players who want to use the game to elevate themselves under the pretense that they're elevating others. Don't let them win. Don't let them stop you from enjoying the combat, the competition, and the masculinity of football. If someone gets hit hard tonight, pray they recover quickly, but don't think for a moment the game should be restricted or eliminated. Truck drivers risk their short and long-term health every day for far less financial reward than football players. How much time have you spent moralizing about the ethics of driving a truck? I'm passionate about the issue of criminal justice and prison reform. I've explored those issues as a journalist. My family has lived through the deadly pain of police misconduct. But pregame gestures do not fix those problems, and neither do well-intentioned but ill-informed posturing by athletes and sports media personalities. The health of the game of football serves us all, but most especially black men, better than using it as a platform to address divisive issues Americans can't agree on. Are you ready for some football? I am, and don't let anyone ruin it. All right, joining me now, three former football players, three former very great football players. Greg Jennings, a former Pro Bowl wide receiver. Brian Cox, a former Pro Bowl linebacker. TJ Hushmanzada, former Pro Bowl wide receiver. I'm sorry, guys, when the Eagles and Falcons kick off, I want to see some tackling, some hitting. <laughs> I want to hear some talking about tackling and hitting and blocking. I don't want to think about the world's problems and serious issues. Enough is enough. It's time to focus on football. I absolutely agree with that, man. I'm, I'm glad this offseason's over. We could talk about tackling, who's winning, who's going to be the surprise team of the, the league this year, who's going to be the team that everybody thinks is going to contend that turns out to be a clunker. I'm not going to feel any shame about just wanting to focus on football, Greg. I'm just, I'm just over it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated to a point that everybody wants me to, to watch this game and think about a bunch of stuff that I think about when I'm not watching football. I don't need it while I'm watching football tonight. I'm sorry. I agree with you. This was the first time I read your essay, and I was like, <laughs> wow. Outside of all the delicious entrees that you will have, <laughs> I'm like, Jason, make a good point. No, when everybody needs a scapegoat. Like, football is to be that. Just football. I, I get it. Everybody has something that they're trying to promote. But for these three hours, three and a half hours, I'm with you. I want to see great plays being made. I want to see football at its finest. And what better than to start with the previous two NFC Super Bowl appearance teams, one being the Super Bowl champions, Eagles, and two years ago, Atlanta Falcons, who kind of blew their chance. We're going to get that anyway. R regardless if anything happens prior to the game, which it's a possibility with Malcolm Jenkins being on the Eagles, we're, we're going to get that regardless as far as great football. 
what the players choose to do prior to the game, whether they do it or they don't do it, it's not going to affect the quality of the game. Not going to affect the quality of the At game, all. but what I'm trying to do, I hope Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth are listening to me right now talk football tonight. Don't let anybody bait you into talking about anything else other than football. I get that when the game kicks off, we're going to focus on football, but, but I just don't like all these other issues hovering over the game of football and, and forcing the broadcasters and everybody else to talk about it. I just think it's inappropriate. There's a better time and play. I just don't think it's effective. You know what? It's almost like after a while when you get the fans that get really drunk and they want to streak on the field or they want to run on it, they stop showing it. So if the, if the announcers choose to not talk about certain things, that's them. If they're smart enough and they want to keep the focus on the game, they want to keep the focus on football, they can do that. It's just up to them to do that. Regardless of what's going on prior to the game, if they want the focus to be football, it's up to them to uh, do that. Do, I mean, are we acting like we don't play a role in that, in, in the seats that we sit in right now? <laughs> We're like, talking we, about it. We, ta <laughs> we talk about everything sometimes other than actual football. or Well, the, the games haven't been here. You're right. The game Now we got games. Now we have things that we can talk about beyond that. And look, let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room because uh, tonight You're Nike's gonna, gonna air mm -hmm. their commercial with Colin Kaepernick. Let's move to that, to a guy trying to upstage the NFL, Colin Kaepernick, who made waves this week with a new commercial from Nike. While the ad has continued to cement Kaepernick's brand as a Twitter folk hero, not everyone was so impressed, including the Redskins' Josh Norman, who took the former quarterback to task for abandoning his own fight saying, quote, when he took a knee, everybody was in shock and everything. But when the bullets start flying, I was trying to figure out where he was at and, and he was ducking when you're in the line of fire and the guys that are over here are trying to have a conversation to move stuff forward. He didn't want to have that conversation. I love these comments from Josh Norman. We, we've had... Colin Kaepernick, I think inappropriately, in a little protective bubble. No one can say anything about Colin Kaepernick. If you criticize him, oh my God, let's throw you out of the human race. Let's throw you out of the black race. Uh, Martin Luther King didn't live in that bubble. He was criticized by Malcolm X. Malcolm X was criticized by Martin Luther King. People that really did sacrifice everything took some heat along the way and were questioned and prodded. Colin Kaepernick has lived in a protective bubble uh, of not reality. And I'm so glad Josh Norman has, has the stomach and the courage to take it on and be honest about Kaepernick. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with what Josh Norman said, but to me, Colin Kaepernick's stance was his own personal stance. It wasn't for him to communicate what he was doing. That was his way of saying, I'm going to stand for po police brutality and things that happen to black and brown people. So, you know, when Josh says he didn't communicate it to me, he didn't have to communicate it. That was his personal thing. The coalition came behind that. He can set the league on, on fire, put all the other players in the middle of a controversy, but he doesn't have to say a word. He jumped on a hand grenade, man. Who did? Kaepernick. No, no, he threw the hand grenade, No, Brian. he jumped on he it. He might have threw it, but he jumped on he it jumped as well. On. So it was his own no, personal No, 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 no. What Josh Norman is saying is Kaepernick threw the grenade, and then ran off into no. obscurity and hiding, and all the rest of us have jumped on the hand grenade. No, they, they dodged in the bullets. He jumped on the hand grenade. He took, the, he, he took the biggest possible risk of his life, losing everything, as the commercial says. He's been out of work, but yet we're still talking about him. That man will be an icon in the future. Oh, I know no. you don't want to hear it, but... It's not true. Muhammad Ali during the time do, doing he was avoiding the, the war... comparing him to Muhammad all, Ali. All I'm quit saying is... Him to all Muhammad I'm Ali. saying is Muhammad, Muhammad Ali... Muhammad, was he afraid of a microphone? Was he afraid of getting an interview? Was he afraid of confronting any of his critics? No. No. He didn't hide but, but was and he let everybody... But was he popular when he was doing it? He's the greatest now. Everybody wants to say he's the greatest. But during the time he when he says, stand, I'm not standing out. He took a real stand so and backed Kaepernick. it up. He hasn't backed it up, Brian. He's running here. A ain't nothing scared about you. I don't understand how you can support and back up a hey, guy man. who's scared who's scared of his own shadow. That man gave up his future right, I, uh, in the ahead, NFL I, I, to make back. sure that I'm other people you, that it, looked like him would have a chance. Number one, he, when he did this, he never thought in a million years, I'm losing my football career. Right. 
He, he never thought that it would be over. And was this thought out? Absolutely not. It wasn't thought out. But you're not thinking of, you don't have a plan when you think, oh, I'm out the, if he knew my career is over, he attacks this differently. He goes about this in a different way. We're all African-American men up here. And we're all up here because of football. But he saw something. He wanted to make a point. He had a big platform being the NFL. And it was not thought out. And that's okay because you don't think the repercussions are going to be this bad. Now, if he could go back and do it again, his plan of attack would be different. And what Brian... He did jump on a hand grenade. Everybody else just followed suit. They piggybacked on what he was doing because nobody had thought of doing this before Kaepernick. All they did was follow suit. They follow suit. That's it. I'm going to go back to Josh Norman's go comments. Ahead. Go ahead. Because I was, I was initially shocked, but then I thought, this is Josh Norman. This is calculated. This is a, <laughs> As you this say, is, clickbait. This is <laughs> the timing of it, the start of the season, He's getting into his mode of being on an island. He plays defensive back. And this is just my opinion, just like that was Josh Norman's opinion. I think this is him utilizing this to where now he, under, now he understands people are going to have some, some, some backlash. He can, he's going to get some backlash about this because he's, in, in most people's eyes, he's, he's going to be seen as attacking Colin Kaepernick. Which but was. I, I think this is what he wants because he's going to isolate himself in his own little space, get on that defensive island that he has to be on for 17 straight weeks and put his blinders on, and it will allow him to lock in. We'll see great football from Josh Norman. He's going to make a lot of new fans as well, but he, he, here's what I think Josh Norman was doing. You guys got to remember, the Players Coalition that Malcolm Jenkins started, which Josh Norman is one of the 12 guys that took part of that, they just put out a long note on the Players' Tribune about their goals starting the season and where they stand right now on, on all the issues. And, and they, in that letter, they showed Kaepernick some love. But I think Josh Norman raised his hand and said, I'm going to step away from this note we're putting out and we're all signing our name to, and I'm going to tell the truth about what we really believe about Kaepernick. And but all of us are going to sign our names to it. Josh Norman is going to be the guy that steps out and says it because this is what I believe they believe. If you go read their document, and again, I think a lot of it is wishful thinking and, and, and a bit naive, but they have a plan, a strategy, a goal. They put some thought into what they're doing. And they're saying, man, this guy didn't. He won't even work with us. He won't even communicate with us. He's not involved at this point. He's out building his brand. And again, if you go look at the note the Players Coalition put out versus the commercial, be something and sacrifice everything or believe in something that has nothing to do with what Kaepernick initially allegedly was protesting, all that Nike commercial is is building the Kaepernick brand of greatness and putting him on the same pedestal as LeBron and Serena and a bunch of people that have accomplished a lot more than him. I got, I love what Josh Norman is doing here. He's speaking the truth. Jason, would there be a players co coalition if it wasn't for Kaepernick? No. Would no. they get the ninety million dollars from the from the owners to fight social injustice it in the community? Be, it no. Twelve oh one. So it, all this happened because it must be twelve oh one. All of it happened because once of Kaepernick. a day you're right at twelve oh one, and you just made some good points. <laughs> that is a very good point. That is a very, but just because his non-thought-out actions led to something. Change. He didn't intend it. Well, he led to We'll see if there's some change. We'll see, look, we'll $90 see million dollars is a change because the NFL don't hand out money. For I understand. No $90 million, Who knows? They could take it to Vegas and blow it. Who knows? Who knows how, if the money's going <laughs> to affect real change? Now, get, I've seen a lot of charities blow money now. That's but, true. But, but I have to give you credit. He did spark something in Malcolm Jenkins, Josh Norman, and all Torrey Smith and all these other guys that they're following through with. I think they have a right to be disappointed that Kaepernick's along, not coming along with him. Okay, and I'm gonna defend Kaepernick with this. He hasn't played in the NFL in he two years. Why should he come show along up? With he, that, he, he, he has a lawsuit out. against the NFL. He can't get on that coalition and he's suing the NFL. Like that that's that's why he's not involved in that. And he hasn't played ball in two years. Why, why would he be out? Nobody That's, wants to hear from him at this point. What do you mean no one wants no to one hear from him? You got him, him on a pedestal point. like he's Gandhi. See, well, he's going to be up there with Muhammad Ali one day. 
See, Plus I think it's I think I think what Kaepernick did, it was thought out. It just wasn't as thought out as the coalition because they had time to then look and see what went wrong. All the backlash what, that he received. Exactly. Yes. And now they like, let's do it this way. Let's make sure we do it a, with a different approach. And so that's what we're seeing. But with Colin Kaepernick not being, he wasn't invited to the first sit down, the first meeting. He was invited. No, he no. was not. No. no, he was not. He was he was invited afterwards. You, because you can't get a hold. Of, you know what? I, I, we got three new inductees <laughs> to the Kaepernick <laughs> Hall of Fame. We got three new. You don't even say the man's name. To the like Kaepernick. Wow. It ain't no, there's Kaepernick. You are he Kaepernick. Kaepernick. He's Kaepernick. <laughs> You cape up for Kaepernick. That's why I call you a Kaepernick. And I'm you gonna stand with that brother. I'm first standing with that brother. Solid Hall of Fame Kaepernick. I'm Brian standing with Cox. that brother. UFC bantamweight champion TJ Dillashaw loves the fight, loves the strategy. And you know what else he loves? Toyo tires. Because like Dillashaw, Toyo tires are tough as they come, and they are the official tire of the UFC. There's a lot to love about Toyo tires. Aggressive design proven on and off the road capabilities, tires for any weather, and the toughness to back it all up. There's a confidence that comes with tough tires. So no matter what you're driving, no matter where you're driving, you can count on Toyo tires. Tough people love tough tires. If you're tough, these are the tires for you, Toyo tires. The next time you need tires, ask for Toyo, the official tire of the UFC. Learn more at toyotires.com backslash UFC. All right, welcome back. Greg Jennings, Brian Cox, and TJ Hoosman's out our back. Let's move to Pittsburgh, where the feud between Le'Veon Bell and the Steelers is heating up. After Bell failed to show up at camp yesterday, several of his teammates sounded like they've lost their patience with the All-Pro running back. I think we were just all grown up to finally accept things at some point, and you're just like, all right, you know what? If you don't want to be here, it is, it is what it is. And hold out 10 weeks. It's totally fine with us. Like, as a team, we're, we're totally fine. It takes 11 guys, not just one. Do you take this personally? No, oh, him not here now. Plays out the way it has. Honestly, I'm such a team guy that, that that doesn't affect me at all. But at this point, it looks like to all of us that he's not in the game plan. So we're gonna move ahead with Connor, and Connor's eager and ready to get out there. In the ultimate team sport, we've created a, a league of individuals in a sense. I know the league is all about get your money, get paid. I love it, but my perspective is a whole lot different now. I'm in year ten. This guy, what is leaving? I'm about to go into year seven. You know, you're not getting younger, so win it, get paid next year. I get it. I understand it. Get your money, but I don't know. At least let us know. Ramon Foster also tweeted out a picture of Le'Veon Bell looking like Where's Waldo. All right, listen. My gut doesn't <laughs> like them talking this kind of trash. Wow. But if I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I got to be honest with you. I'm thrilled to death. These guys are all in this year about winning and this team. I, I, I don't like them really talking smack on Le'Veon Bell. But I think it's an indication that the Steelers, to a man, are all in about this year and trying to take advantage of Big Ben being in the best shape, Big Ben being at the end of his prime, Antonio Brown being at the, at the beginning of his prime. I, I feel like Mike Tomlin's got this team on edge in the right way for the beginning of the season. Well, Jason, I was laughing because yesterday we had the conversation and I was saying that, you know, from a player standpoint, when you look at what Earl Thomas said, talking about not letting my teammates down, not letting the city down, the fans, that's what's happening with Le'Veon. And the players stood with him in the preseason, but now when the regular season starts, I'm not counting your money, but you're messing with my money now because we need you to be among the best teams in the league, and you can't get games away. So, you know, I don't have a problem with what the Steelers are saying. I think Le'Veon is getting bad advice from a D.C., his agent. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, but I want to let the other guys, you know, chime in here. But it, it's not a good situation. You just want to celebrate being right for a change again. Man, so. that's, <laughs> that's one time each day. <laughs> the way they're talking, y'all both wrong. 100% wrong ain't even close to being right. <laughs> this is like unreal. You no. Know, do you, man, Ramon Foster needs to shut up for, like, dude. No. You don't do this. Yes, you do. Okay, look. Marquise Pouncey, when you signed your deal, you're the highest paid center in the league. They didn't ha you didn't have to complain about getting paid. They gave you your money. Mm -hmm. Big Ben, they give you your money. Right. Le'Veon Bell is the best back in the league. Pay me as such. You don't. Mike Tomlin, you talking about, oh, he has his team on edge. Mike Tomlin is tripping. Because you get in that meeting and you say, don't comment on Le'Veon Bell. You know you're going to get asked this question. 
And for them to talk about this openly, like, you don't do that type of stuff TJ. at all. It would be a problem when he comes back in the locker room. It's going to be a problem. TJ, let me, let me just say this. I'm messing with your money. Okay. It's my money. Okay. It's me first, then the team. Oh, so you the selfish player? Because you no, getting fourteen no, million dollars? No, you, no. You getting? You pay within the top ten. How many league? touches is he gonna get this year? Well, if he don't show up to week ten, probably two hundred. So at the end of the day, and that's if, a lot if, in six if, weeks. At the end of the day, here, here's the issue: it's a team game from my standpoint. I'm not messing with your money. I stood with you doing preseason. I said, hey man, this guy needs to be paid. He's one of the best. But when we come in here on uh, week one regular season. It's time to roll. We got to put that behind us. You got $14 million on the table. Two years will give you 26. Again, I'm not counting your money. That's your deal. Yeah, you but are. I'm saying, you, you hurt my money now. No, I'm going to your money. You, you stopping me from potentially having a chance to go to the Super Bowl because you are the number one bell count. You are the guy that we count on. You are the so top you're making three. my point. But Pittsburgh, as an organization, has decided that they don't want to give you the money because, again, as I said yesterday, I believe there's a defect. The second thing, DC, his agent, is trying to put him himself on a platform and trying to get ahead in recruiting saying we don't want Le'Veon to have those kind of numbers this year running, touching the ball that way because we're trying to protect them from getting hurt. If I'm an organization looking at this next year, I'm damn sure not going to pay a 27-year-old running back. They not paying really him gonna, anyway. No, I'm saying the organization that a DC thinks is going to pay him, I'm not going to pay him that kind of money because this guy seems to be the kind of guy that if he gets paid, he ain't going to go to work. Go ahead, Greg. I go have ahead. every, I'm with you. Right. Y'all are selfish. You're on no, the right side. No, it has we nothing, smart. It has nothing to do with self. You talking about they not counting. You talking about they not counting his money. He's comparing. I'm making. He's making Seven two and three and four times, times more, than more than me. So what? What they're what they're disturbed about is Wednesday they thought he was coming in. Because and so, it's time so, to roll. Hold on, hold on. David DeCastro says we thought he was gonna be here today. This was a couple days ago. He makes us all look kind of stupid. That's their problem. He he didn't show up. Number one, they should have never <laughs> pounced. He should have never said, "Oh, he'll be here Wednesday." Well, Don't say that. You, he's, no, a, he's a captain. No, it doesn't matter and when how ben much. Ben made his statements. We ain't saying nothing about no, Ben. No, no, he Ben ain't talking about his. He's not talking about his money. He's not talking about man. He's selfish, or we we basically see who he is. This is you, my guy. You don't. You, my, you guy. my guy. I thought you was my guy. Cause I'm gonna come to bite. I'm gonna come to fight for you. When it if you get in a fight on the street, B Cox coming throwing haymakers. We well, going why, down together. Well, why? Well, why aren't you backing me and telling them to pay me I, then? I did all preseason. Now they didn't pay no, you. They, no, no. They, you didn't sign your tenure to make your fourteen okay. million. See, when this you, is what's we need going to on. Win. When you I were playing, win. when you were playing in your prime, when Emmett Smith had his holdout, what did what did Charles Haley do? He had a fit. Like, y'all better get him in here throwing helmets through the through the wall. Like, well, I mean, the that, was, that, was before, the, that was before they knew Charles Haley had all the mental. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I, I, let me let me ask this question to, to the guy, Greg and T. To the selfish guy. Yeah. Well, well, to the guys with a different point of view. Do y'all think there maybe is what what Brian's saying? There's a defect somewhere, and Brian's put it on the agent. I'm saying. If his relationship with his teammates was better previously, in the previous years, would they be doing this? I think there may be some guys in that locker room, like when he showed up five minutes left in a walkthrough on Saturday before a playoff game, there's other things he's been doing along the way that they feel like we don't have to support him to, to uh, we don't have to die on the hill with Le'Veon because he hasn't fine. been dying with that, us. That's fine. But don't, but don't talk about this. That's okay. This is what's happened. The organization and Mike Tomlin, they got the players fighting their battle for him. That's all. Dude, Mike Tomlin is okay in this, and that's not cool. Because if they get parked this week by Cleveland, and then they lose their next game, they go, oh, man, they distracted by... Man, just worry about you. Worry about the game. If he shows I, I, up, I, he I, shows I, up. I, I can't worry about just me because... If you got it, so it, much it, faith it, in James Conner, you ain't tripping well, on Avion not being what here. Bothers I, I, I've me. never said that. What I'm saying, though, is week one... Right now, these games are now important. They are now for real. It's not some, let's see who the rookies are, let's try to figure out what our, what our team is. We know what our team is. You are one of the big three on our team. We are depending on you. If we go out there and we get off to a slow start and we start to struggle, you lessen my opportunity to potentially make the playoffs and make the Super Bowl. Now, that's messing with my money. 
That's how we get into the messing with Brian, my money. Brian, what you're making you're making messing a great with point. your money, but, but they're not the, messing with his money. Exactly. Like, like, he, that's he his, messing with his money. He didn't sign the tender. He got 14 million on the table. See, come on. He, man. he hadn't signed his tender. When you look 14 at, million dollars ain't good money for a running back. When you when you look at the landscape of what has been transpiring with contracts, even let's go with just the running back. Look at what Ty Gurley got. You well, mean to tell me he can't get three quarters of that? He has to get something. Well, what's the difference? Todd Gurley showed up. It's a different you, situation. You, you got to show up to get I'm paid. Not, Jason, Football players want to wanna play. To your point, I think there probably is some type of defect. But like you said, so what? You don't talk about what's going on in my pocketbook measuring what I'm potentially making or what I could make or why I should be in because I'm making more than you. That has nothing to do with it. I we know gotta, what I We got to go. We okay. got to go. I, I, the last thing I'm going to say on this, and I'm sorry that you don't have a chance to respond, is somebody I was looking for, one of these players said something about the league being more about the individual now. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and and That was I, Ramon Foster. Okay, Ramon Foster said that. And I think that's a growing sentiment around the league because some of these players think the same thing that I think. That some guys on the team, from Antonio Brown with the Facebook Live to every, everybody with their Twitter brands, it's all about how I can use football to elevate myself. And so when I hear them talk about this individuality, I think there's also some guys, and again, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think it's part of it, it's just they look at the Kaepernick thing. They look at the Players Coalition thing. It's like everything's not about football anymore. And so, Brian, you're asking for I'm sorry for not letting you respond, but it's like you're asking for people to have that old school. It's all about the team deal. But if you look across the league, it's all about your social media brand. It's all about what you're doing for this or that. It's not just about football anymore, Two Brian. words, salary cap. That's made the game a selfish game. Before the salary cap, everybody when guys get up. released. Nobody cries about that. Nope. Nobody uh, cries about let, when let a guy gets released. Let me say this about nobody. the salary cap. I've never believed in it. We'll get to it. Of the Rams. You think they got a salary cap? If an owner's willing to come out of his pocket with upfront money, the salary cap is irrelevant. Thank you. All right, welcome back, Greg Jennings, Brian Cox, and T.J. Husmanzada. Cox just told an incredible story about how much money <laughs> he threw away with the Jets. All right, but let's move to Philadelphia. Well, the NFL season kicks off tonight with the Eagles hosting the Falcons. The Super Bowl champs have been enjoying a victory lap this offseason with Coach Doug Peterson and Nick Foles both writing books. Lane Johnson continuing to trash talk the Patriots and Malcolm Jenkins launching a silent protest during OTAs. Listen, I think the Philadelphia Eagles are full of themselves. I think they're going to get a big a batch of humble pie tonight. I don't think they're going to be repeating. I don't think they're ready for the start of the season. They've been on book tours and celebration tours and arrogance tours. I don't think they're ready for the start of the season. Neither do I. And you look at the preseason, they've struggled offensively. Uh, the one thing that they are still capable of is playing really good defense. And so I think the defense will keep them in it early. You can't really go by the numbers of the preseason because no real game plans are being uh, put into uh, place, uh, now you start real football and you start cutting down the playbook, not calling all the plays, putting the things in that Nick Foles is comfortable with. I think the offense will do a good enough job. I think they beat Atlanta tonight. I don't see them as competing for a Super Bowl this year. I do think that the hangover will get them. Every team is, is going to be ready to play. I mean, you you go through all season. Every season's. team is going to be ready. They're going for the Bengals, TJ. And they're going to be ready. They're going to win the division this year, too. <laughs> they're going to win the division. Remember I told you that. Every team, when you go through an offseason and you go through training camp, everybody feels like they got a chance. They're going to be ready to play now. Are they going to win tonight? I don't believe they're going to win tonight. Their defense is going to keep them in every game because they're going to be that good up front. Offensively, Alshon Jeffrey won't be playing today. That's going to hurt them. You don't put too much stock in the preseason. There's not much game planning, even though in game three you will put a little game planning in. The Falcons just have an impressive roster. They, they have an impressive, impressive roster of players on that team to where if they stay healthy, they got a chance to beat anybody, and they got a chance to win the Super Bowl. It's not no fault of the Eagles. It's just, number one, they've been taught. That's what you do. When you win and you have fun and you've been under – you're going to talk. It's a new generation. You're going you're gonna to put your chest out. That's just what you do. <laughs> And that's not going to have an effect on today's game. No, uh, the Eagles are focused on defending their title. And this, this whole idea of Super Bowl hangover, like, 
It's Shut, real. No, it's real. It's, it's real. real. It's, it's real. real. It's Look, real, okay, let me explain. Do you have a Super Bowl? Yep. As a Did, player, and I competed in one as a coach. And Atlanta. you felt like you had a Super Bowl hangover the next year? I, I felt like during the offseason, everybody sugaring you up, paying for your meals, old ladies kissing you. What's that got to do with you working? What do with your drive? The hunger. Yes, let me, it does. Let me, you, let me, you, let me. You don't have a okay. drive. Okay. Yeah, you do. So we won the Super Bowl, 2010-11. Mm -hmm. Next year was a lockout. Drew Brees and everybody getting together with their, their quarterbacks and their, their receivers, and they're going. All we heard was Aaron Rodgers isn't getting together with none of his receivers. All we did that year was go 15-1. and one. You call that a Super Bowl hangover? No. These guys will be ready to play. The now, lockout saved you. No. These guys will be ready to play <laughs> because they are, they, they're, they're still the hunters, but they now they have to find a way to even more so be a hunter because – Everybody's Rick, hunting them. They have a target on their back. I, I get there's a stat since 03, no one has repeated as Super Bowl champion. That's it's a lot. I but a lot, I of, a lot of the time when getting, you win a Super Bowl, a, long one. a lot of the time when you NFL win a history. Super Bowl, you, you have a lot of players that leave because they go get paid. And, the and so you guys, lose players. They haven't lost many players. And, the, and they the other, haven't. Other guys that stay there, though, somehow feel like they're the reason that they won. Do like, you bring in Michael Bennett? Like, Michael Bennett's a dog up front. Like, their defensive line is going to be very impressive. Are, but Brandon Graham is hurt. The thing that I say about Philadelphia tonight, if you look at the last two times they played Atlanta, one, I was on the, on the Atlanta coaching staff, and I think they beat us 24 to 15 or something. And then last year in the playoffs, the game was 15-10. Schwartz knows how to play against Atlanta's offense. They don't score many points. So the defense to keep them in it. It'll just be interesting to see tonight if Nick Foles can lead the offense to 20 points, first of 20 wins. All right, to the Falcons, who were one Julio Jones stumble away from stopping the Eagles in the divisional round last season. But now Matt Ryan has even more familiarity with offensive coordinator Steve Sarkeesian, and I think they're the biggest threat to unseat the Eagles in the NFC. I am high on the Atlanta Falcons, uh, they've got the right defensive line coach in there, finally, after years of having to recover <laughs> from Brian Cox coaching the defensive line. Uh, seriously, I just think uh, Julio Jones is going to have a hell of a season. He's paid. He's happy. I think that's got Matt Ryan's familiarity with Steve Sarkeesian. Is, is, I, I love the Falcons this year. No. And, 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 and I think they'll be good and they'll contend. But the NFC South is one of the toughest – uh, divisions in all the football. You look at the Saints made the playoffs last year. Carolina was in the Super Bowl three years ago. Tampa Bay was a team that everybody thought last year would win the division, and their defense went through so many injuries that they could not compete. Tampa is a team that I'm looking at as a surprise team to compete and come out Famous of the Winston NFC South. Can't even play. It don't matter. He got three games. When he when he comes back, they'll be one and two, and they're gonna run. I'm telling you, their offense is phenomenal. And the defense won't play as bad as they played last year. That's the team that I'm looking at coming out of the South. Man, what's, what, what, I'm a Green they, Bay Packer. Uh, uh, <laughs> what they do to you in Atlanta? Man, man. I just said no. I'm, I think Atlanta's gonna be there, and I just said whoever comes out of the South, it's, you know, a, it's a really you know good. You know he got division. fired in Atlanta. I, you, but you know, I'm not mad though. I just want Gray to. My son plays for Carolina. If you didn't, know. and I didn't say Carolina, I didn't pull Carolina out of my head. I just said Tampa Bay. Carolina I, didn't fire you. Before. I like the Falcons. <laughs> I like the Falcons a lot. I don't like them more than I like the Vikings. And, and that's a whole nother topic. But I, I like the Falcons. I was down at their practice two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's different. When, and again, you, you've been in that culture. Mm -hmm. But when you get to see them play, and my whole outlook on Matt Ryan and his approach to the game, you know, him not showing that fiery side of him, that leadership that we want him to show, he has that. He has it. He yeah. has that. I, I like the way Dan Quinn approaches the, these guys. He builds trust with his players to make sure. Like, Julio Jones didn't see a snap. No, no I, 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 would just, I would just hit you on one spot here. Who's going to replace Taylor Gabriel? That was the one guy that can stretch the field. Okay, Thomas Sanu is a really good player, but he's a possession if receiver. You look at, he's underneath. Look at the Falcon skill guys. You got Julio Jones. You got Muhammad Sanu. You got Calvin Ridley from Calvin. Alabama. Yeah, he's you a got slot receiver. Tevin. The running back, you got Devontae Freeman. Mm -hmm. They have arguably the best set of skilled players in the league. Did they have them last year? Yeah. They what did. happened? New offensive it, coordinator. What, Couldn't get it to Matt happened? Ryan's like, going to have to form that cohesiveness with Sarkeesian to where they get on a roll. When, when he calls a play, you know what defense he's expecting. So you already have an idea of what you who, should do who, with the ball. Who's the you, speed? 
You lost Taylor Gabriel. That was the guy that took the top who's off. Who's a speed? Hill. Yeah, who's Julio speed? Jones is a speed. <laughs> no, I'm saying you need somebody opposite Julio. Calvin really can Julio run. gets taken. He he takes three defenders. And Calvin Julio Re- is the best in the game. Everybody talk about Antonio Brown. This guy takes two and three guys. Calvin now, Ridley the problem can is, run. Ridley is a slot receiver. No, he's, he's not. not. Start, I, who, he going to start in ahead of uh, Muhammad Sanu? When they go three wide. Is he going to start? Is he no, gonna start no, 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 no. So, no. so then when how they is go he gonna, three wide, Sanu's going to go on the slot, and Ridley's going to go to the outside. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. Is, 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 is he as good as Taylor Gabriel? He's better. Man, you've been I, smoking will, something. You've been, no, you've been I smoking know. hookah. Okay. You've been hey, smoking hookah. I ain't never smoked nothing a day in my life, and I ain't going to start. <laughs> so to answer the, the best team right now in the NFC. Green Bay Packers. TJ, I don't know if I told you this earlier, but Atlanta fired Brian Cox. So <laughs> Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers. Or the Green L.A. Rams. Green Bay Packers. The L.A. Rams. L.A. going to have to go to Lambeau it, Field in the playoffs. All right, welcome back. Greg Jennings. And former Atlanta Falcons defensive line coach, now unemployed, <laughs> Brian Cox. And we're joined now by the founder of the big lead, Jason McIntyre. Let's move to Denver, where the Broncos released former first-round pick Paxton Lynch this week, making him the latest quarterback of the John Elway era that hasn't worked out. In a new Sports Illustrated piece, Elway admits evaluating quarterbacks is tough, while former teammate Terrell Davis offers an explanation for Elway's struggle, saying, quote, there aren't a lot of John Elways out there. We look at Michael Jordan and say he should be able to find and identify the best basketball players in the world, but it doesn't work that way. The problem is it's hard for John to see a quarterback and the kid can't do what he can do because he thinks everybody should be able to do it. Uh, respectfully, uh, Terrell Davis, Terrell Davis I, I just don't buy this. Everybody has a problem finding a quarterback, particularly when you're not regularly drafting at the top of the draft like the Broncos aren't. Uh, I think it's a struggle for everybody. I don't think he's got some special quirk because he's a former great player. Uh, Look, they found Peyton Manning with a neck injury, and he had some success, and they they ended up, the defense dragged him to a Super Bowl. But uh, I don't have any problem with Elway striking out and missing on quarterbacks. I don't think there's anything unique about it. Um, Neither do I. And And the second thing is, it's hard because in college you get all these spread offenses and now you're trying to look at who fits and Paxton Lynch was prolific when he was at Memphis and now all of a sudden you bring him in to, to Denver and you put him in a pro style offense and it's a non-fit. I mean, he can't see it the same. So one of the things for any team is to find guys that can transition from that spread offense, run first kind of mentality, throw short passes, RPOs, to somebody that can take the ball from under center, drop back, and throw it. I mean, that's a hard deal. There are only about 10 good quarterbacks in the whole league. So somebody's without a good quarterback. I, I agree with Terrell Davis uh, in what he's saying. It, it, when, you're, when you're looking for something that you have been, mm-hmm. sometimes you're, you're hoping that you can develop it. You're hoping that they can turn into something special at quarterback because you, in your mind, that's the way you work and you're wired. So I can see where there can be some type of, man, I, I, I hit and miss. What I do commend uh, John Elway for is getting rid of Paxton Lynch. Because sometimes when they don't work and admitting to it, sometimes you try to hold on to something that is just, it, it's not for you. It's not going to work. To your point, that spread offense and quarterbacks making the transition to under center. It's a completely different quarterbacking and footwork and timing. Being under center and footwork versus spread offense and not really having to utilize footwork, completely different timing. It's it's a growing curve. I love the excuses for John Elway. I mean, geez, uh, I mean, he's just such a great quarterback. It's so difficult for him no, to find no someone excuses. on his level. No excuses, Greg. Come on. Uh, even if you want to look beyond just the quarterback, which he's struggled to identify. His 2017 draft, they just dropped four of the guys that he drafted. We can admit John Elway has struggled as a GM. That, we can admit that. That's fine. And he got lucky, I would say, Whitlock, with, with uh, Peyton Manning. He got lucky. He got, the, he got the star quarterback in Peyton Manning. But, you know, this whole excuse of, oh, well, he hasn't drafted at the top of the draft. Okay, well, uh, Russell Wilson wasn't at the top of the draft. Dak Prescott wasn't. We could go on down the list. Kirk Cousins was a middle-round draft pick. I know Elway was a great quarterback, and the fact of the matter is he can't draft quarterbacks. Would, would, the- would you say Kirk Cousins is the end-all, be-all? I mean, when you look at Russell Wilson and you look at Dak, 
They were lucky to get those guys. Nobody ever thought those guys were going to be what they are. That's why they went in the fourth and the third round, respectively. So Kirk Cousins is not a guy that everybody's, you know, like, oh, this guy can win the Super Bowl. Washington let him go for a reason. He just got okay, 90 what, million that's guaranteed. What, that's the market, though. You can look at the 32 teams in the NFL, and you can say there are really only 10 to 12 really good quarterbacks, and the rest of them are just guys. My point that I think sometimes gets overlooked about the quarterback or just anybody – it's the spread offense and all that, but I just don't think you ever know how any young person is going to react when you hand them millions of dollars. You don't know how that's going to change them. And then getting dropped into an NFL locker room is a unique experience. Some guys just aren't ready for that. I can remember guy I grew up with, Jeff George. His first center was a guy named Ray Donaldson. Mm -hmm. And Ray Donaldson was a very Old. difficult person, <laughs> a very difficult person to work with. And, and instead of wrapping his arms around a rookie quarterback, he kind of tortured him and played pranks on him and did all kinds of things that muddied up the situation in Indianapolis. So I, I just think it's a crapshoot for anybody at quarterback when they're drafting. You drop those kids into an NFL locker room. And I mean, some of them get swallowed they, they, up. This was a Denver team that just won the Super Bowl, had a good offensive line, had good receivers. He couldn't beat out Trevor Simeon in back-to-back -back training camps. This is a massive whiff, guys. I, I understand Stop that, but you, you, you're saying that we're defending Elway, but in the same article, John Lynch makes the statement that I don't even scout safeties because of that very reason, because I'm looking for me. All right, welcome back. Brian Cox is here for Last Call. Let's move to the Rams where Executive Vice President Kevin Dimoff just revealed that the team made a serious effort to trade for Khalil Mack. The Rams have already shelled out tens of millions this offseason. Brian, how could the Rams possibly afford Khalil Mack? Because their owner doesn't care about giving out the cash out of his pocket. So if you make it guaranteed money, you can sign more of highly touted players. I've said this for years. People in Kansas City will remember I used to champion the no salary cap limit soldiers is what I used to call <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs and wanted to pressure Lamar Hunt into spending as much money in signing bonuses because that's how you stretch out the cap. Obviously, the Rams aren't afraid to spend that cash. All right, football starts tonight with the Super Bowl champion Eagles hosting the Falcons. I don't see Philly defending their title this year. Brian, I'm picking Atlanta and the Pittsburgh Steelers to meet in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Who are your Super Bowl picks? Green Bay Packers in the NFC for sure. Now I got Green three Bay teams. with no defense. Their defense, Mike Pettin was the best player move, non-player move of the whole offseason. They got Muhammad Wilkerson from the Jets who didn't want to work in New York. Mike He's Daniel. back under Pettin. He'll work. They drafted two cornerbacks, so they'll be good. The defense will be good. I don't know who's coming out the AFC. The Patriots, the Chargers, or the Houston Texans. Those are the three teams. Patriots, Chargers, or Houston Texans. Chargers is kind of a sexy pick. I love their defensive ends. They're certainly going to pressure the quarterback. I'm just not a big Phillip Rivers guy. Football tonight! <laughs>